Hi, I'm Femi OK. On this episode on the stream, we are looking at the relationship between Palestinians and the Black Lives Matter movements around the world, but specifically in the United States, and how that relationship is evolving. When we asked our stream community to unpack what black Palestinian solidarity looked to them, this is what they told us. Really going back to the 1960s, uh, black Americans have felt a, a kindred sense of uh, solidarity with Palestinians. And so even today, uh, decades later, we've seen recent protests about Gaza, uh, many black activists in, and other people in support of the Palestinians because they see themselves as part of, of, of a global struggle of marginalized people fighting against systems of oppression that are backed by the United States. And I think Palestinians have embraced that, including in the slogan that I've seen uh, that says, we can't breathe since 1948. We as black Americans understand the liberation of Palestine is deeply connected to the black American experience as they are formed with the same building blocks of racism, white supremacy, and oppression. The IDF and Israel are largely supported and funded by the U.S., the same U.S., which no matter who is in charge, be it the Democrats or Republicans, uh, continues to fund police departments which occupy and kill with near impunity and also treat with as second class citizens, black people here in the US. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can jump into the comment section. Here's a question to get you started. Is the US Black Lives Matter movement changing the conversation about Palestinians? Jump into the comment section. Your comments may well be part of today's show. Let me introduce you to our guests. They are heavyweights and very well known on Al Jazeera. Hello, Linda. Hello, Mark. I am not going to introduce you, but I want you to introduce yourself in the context of this discussion. Linda, you start. I'm so honored to be here. My name is Linda Sarsour, and I am an unapologetic Palestinian-American daughter of Palestinian immigrants to the United States of America. I'm also a racial justice activist and have been on the streets of the United States for the last two decades fighting for black and brown communities, marginalized people. Um, I'm a leader in uh, civil disobedience and direct action, and I'm just very happy to be here with you, Femi, and also with Mark. Mark, in the context of what you do, who you are, introduce yourself to our stream audience. I am uh, Mark Lamont Hill. I am a professor uh, who uh, studies the issue and question of race in the Middle East. I am very interested in uh, the Afro-Palestinian population in the old city of Jerusalem. I am someone who studies transnational uh, solidarities between black Americans and Palestinians. Uh, I am an activist, I am an organizer, and I am a former <laughs> uh, uh, commentator for a major cable news network and currently the host of Upfront right here at Al Jazeera. Yeah. I'm glad you can laugh about that right now. All right, so uh, we'll we mention that in just a moment. Uh, I feel that you are both highly qualified so you can both stay and be on the rest of this show. All right, so Mark, let's start with uh, recent news from the Gaza Strip, from East Jerusalem. People around the world were watching this news. People in America were watching this news. How do you feel it played out? Online and offline, did you notice anything different about the way Palestinians and their cause was being reported or shared? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the first thing is that the Palestinian cause was being reported and shared. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, if you if you look in the 1970s, I mean, you you, you think about uh, the refusal to even say the word Palestinian, and it wasn't just Palestinian. I remember Peter Jennings talked about this when he was. Uh, I believe in Lebanon, he, he was in Beirut, and he was talking about how the media in newsrooms only would say Arab. Whether, it didn't matter whether you were Syrian, whether you were Lebanese, whether you were Jordanian, whether you were Yemeni, it didn't matter, you were just Arab. And so to fast forward from that moment to a moment now, where not only are Palestinians identified, but the actual cause is being pointed to and spotlighted, not, not, not as effectively as we would like to see, but surely uh, the conversation has shifted. I mean, when we saw the initial uh, uprising in Sheikh Jarrah, the first thing that I saw uh, was an honest uh, attempt by some media outlets to say, hey, wait a minute, this is a violation of international law. Hey, wait a minute, they're displacing people who are in an occupied territory. That didn't happen before. You know, some people still want to call it a real estate dispute, but uh, <laughs> many people saw it for what it was. And then once we got to what was happening uh, in, in Gaza, the, the, the question became, um, is this just Israel defending itself, which is what the narrative has been so long, particularly Operation 
uh, if you look at Operation Cast Lead, Operation uh, uh, Protective Edge, even uh, it, it was less so, but but still the case. But now there was a, there was some honesty in reporting. People talked about disproportionate force. People said, "Has Israel done too much?" People were critical of Netanyahu, and people uh, had some principled representations of it. And let me say one more quick thing. Um, a big part of that is not because major cable news outlets or major network news outlets had a philosophical reorientation. They didn't get religion. They didn't fall off their horse. What happened was everyday people got access to media. Suddenly, you have people in the old city showing their own experiences. You have people in Aqsa Mosque showing the police pummeling them uh, three days before Eid. And when you see that stuff, it's hard to ignore. And similar to when George Floyd got killed, e e no matter how race blind and color neutral you want to be when you see yeah. that man dying in front of your eyes in the united states you, you gotta do something about it so lindsay here's our That's show right. here's our show fuses that change that mark described that change was partly due to the black lives matter movements of today absolutely i believe that fundamentally as someone who is part of the Black Lives Matter movement, but also the longstanding solidarity that Black people have shown to Palestinians. Um, we can go back to Kwame Ture, a.k.a. Stokely Carmichael, and Angela Davis, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the U.S., but of course, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, and leaders across the African nations. For me, the Black Lives Matter movement has been very deliberate about making the Black Lives Matter movement a global struggle, a global social justice movement, which then uh, kind of portrays this principle that our liberation here in the United States of America, the liberation of black people, is bound up with the liberation of people all over the world. And so when black people are in the streets, when black people are raising their voices in the United States um, as a continuation of a civil and human rights movement, it, people start paying attention. And that's why I always say when black people are free, we're all going to be free. Mm. And so watching mo movement for black lives and black lives matter. And I mean that in the general sense of people who believe in this idea of sanctity of black life, you know, they're, 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 the integration of Palestine has been very unapologetic. The endorsement of the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement has been truly unapologetic. And have they received backlash for it? Absolutely. But what the Black Lives Matter movement has done is never back down. And that is why this past summer, and even before, but also just continuing into today, uh, having statements come out of leaders of the Black Liberation Movement has been extremely not only important and beautiful to see as a Palestinian American, but has mm. also been quite influential uh, in politics in the United States and really around the world. What moved you when you heard statements? Because I, I saw a lot of Palestinians saying thank you, right? Uh, they were seeing celebrities tweeting and, and, and putting themselves out there on social media. They were saying thank you, we feel seen. What moved you, Linda? You know, for me, Femi, uh, my, uh, what moves me is that every day um, as a Palestinian American, I have to fight for my identity. I have to explain who I am. And there are oppositional forces every day who get up every morning to try to erase my identity as a Palestinian. Tell it, you know, there's narratives out there that there's no such thing as Palestinians, as mm -hmm. if I and my family walking around are like a figment of our own imagination. And so to see a movement that is also oppressed, people that are also marginalized, people who are fighting for their own existence and their own dignity, saying, wait a minute, we are also fighting for the dignity and to see the existence of the Palestinian people thrive is beautiful. It is, it's everything that I dream of, of being part of a movement that sees liberation bound up with one another. Mm -hmm. Mark, I, yes. have, I, I have seen and heard you uh, describe why black people and Palestinians, why there are parallels between their experiences. I, I've heard you unpack that, describe it. Our audience gets it. This is Liz Rainey here on YouTube. I think the foundation was laid by people like Nelson Mandela, openly comparing apartheid in South Africa and Palestine and standing against it, one of the OGs out there. And then on Twitter, very close parallels between black experiences, both South African and American, at the heart of apartheid in South Africa. Scores of people, including kids, get killed by the state security for simply protesting. Our audience are on board with this. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's important to know that the world is beginning to see parallels. But I, I'm always... Um, equally hasty to point out that solidarity does not hinge upon, nor does it require, um, sameness. Our circumstances are different in many, many ways. 
Um, it, I'm, it's not about who has it worse. Um, it's not about who whose oppression is more urgent. It's about, on the one hand, saying, yes, there are systems and structures that connect us, right? Systems of power. White supremacy is a global system. Capitalism is a global system. And so the same forces that oppress someone in, 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 in Brooklyn will oppress somebody in El Bire, right? That's just the reality of, of what it means to be in a capitalist system. It's what it means to live in an imperialist world where the United States has a very particular invested interest in having uh, outposts in the Middle East, whether it's through Saudi Arabia, whether it's through the state of Israel, whether it's through increasingly Jordan and Egypt, whatever the case might be. So we, we, we have to think about the connections. We have to think about state power as a connection. We have to be able to say that the state the nation state itself, which is a relatively new and modern idea, functions in certain ways. It, it, this nation state itself is occasioned by violence and erasure and dislocation and dispossession. And so the same system that takes mm -hmm. Native Americans in, 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 in the United States and displaces them and erases them and, and ultimately in some ways blames them for their own, for their own death, it, it's not surprising that we'll see the same thing to someone who's Yazidi in Iraq or someone who's who, who's who's Palestinian. We, we, we'll see the same system. So in that sense, we have commonalities, right? In, in, in that sense, state violence is a common experience. But there's also ways that our solidarities um, don't have to hinge just on that, because there's a very particular way that when I fly to. Uh, and I don't do this, but when, if I were to fly to Tel Aviv and I can just land and decide that, hey, I'm going to go and, and hang out in, in Akka and, 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 you know, and go to Nazareth and, and then go south and go to Tel Aviv and, or, or go back to Tel Aviv and then go to Jerusalem. Linda can't do that. She, 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 she with the Hawiya, with the, with the West Bank ID, may have to make a different set of choices, despite the fact that it's her homeland. So in some ways, I have more freedom of movement than she does in her own homeland. That's not an experience that I can relate to as a black American. I'm not stateless the way many people are. I'm not, I'm not bordered by land, air, and sea like people in Gaza are. There, there's a way, that, in the same way that Palestinians were never enslaved, in, 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 like we were in the United States. So I, I don't need our situations to be the same for us to have solidarity, because a lot of times people say, oh, being Palestinian is just like being black. Well, no, it's not. Just like being black isn't like being Palestinian. They're different. That's right. But they're, they're equally important. And so I don't need to stand up for Palestinians because I see myself there, or, or but because I know that oppression is real. And so for me, it's the connections, it's the systems, but it's also just the right thing to do, despite the fact that there are considerable differences. That's right. And, and it's important, Mark, that you say that, because it's not the same being black and also being Palestinian um, like me. But black people have been experiencing oppression around the world, but specifically in the United States for close to four centuries. And so it's not the same. The Palestinian people have been under occupation, their land stolen, uh, the displacement, the dispossession has been going on for 73 years. And this is not oppression Olympics. I think black people are naturally in solidarity with the Palestinian people for many reasons and many that you've listed. But as Americans, the solidarity with Palestinians um, is seen through the lens of also the economy and watching the military aid that we send to the state of Israel. You know, when, when I'm in protest um, around issues of police brutality or even racial justice issue, economic justice issues, and we're fighting and saying, we need health care for all Americans and all those who reside in the United States. We need uh, access to high quality public education across this country uh, for every child, regardless of their zip code. And we need to open more hospitals and more clinics. And especially in light of a global pandemic that we're in, our government often tells us we are idealistic. We don't have these kind of resources. But we apparently have $10 million that we send to the state of Israel every day to occupy and dispossess mm. and, and really terrorize the Palestinian people. And that, for me, is how I kind of come into the movements and saying, listen, we need to make these connections. There's also the incarceration connection. Some of these same for-profit incarceration, uh, for-profit uh, prison companies uh, that incarcerate black and brown people in the United States and make money off of them are the same companies that that profit off of the incarceration of Palestinians in the West Bank and also within Israel, uh, uh, you know, companies like G4S. So there's also an economic conversation to be had here. And for me, uh, also watching 
the, the kind of young people who are now engaging in electoral politics in the United States, but really in other parts of the, the world, particularly in the West, where, you know, we're electing more members of parliament, more members of Congress in the United States of America who are ready to be unapologetic about supporting the Palestinian people. And that's new. Uh, we've never seen that before in our lifetime. At least I haven't seen that in my lifetime. And to your point, Mark, about you know being going to Palestine, you know I'm an American, and so I carry an American passport. So me personally, I always have the chance of not being let in just based on my activism and really based on you know my very vehement critique of the state of Israel. But I have a son um, who right now is 22 years old, and he carries a Palestinian uh, ID card as well as an American citizen because of a derivative of his father, who is Palestinian and born and raised in El Bida, Palestine. And my son can't go to Jerusalem. And so when we go to Palestine, and I've been to Palestine many times, we have been separated as a family because there's certain places that I can go and certain places that my son can't go. And I remember this, and I shared this story before, that my daughters, who at the time a few years ago were young, they were young teenagers, tweens even, were basically protested me in my village where my family's from because they found out that their cousins were not allowed to travel to Jerusalem with us on a day trip. And my daughters were so outraged. They said, what do you mean? We're American and we flew on an airplane for hundreds of miles and we could go to Jerusalem and the people who live 15 minutes away cannot go. We are not going. And I couldn't believe it. I just paid $1,700 a ticket for each child. And my daughters were like, no matter what you tell us, we're not going. This is unfair. This is unjust. <laughs> Apple you know, doesn't I fall far from the tree, Linda. <laughs> you, 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 you brought up what you deserve. <laughs> one time. I, know that one time I, was I spent money activist children. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I want to bring up um, an acronym that I learned from you, Mark. It's a PEP. What is a PEP? I want you to just describe it very briefly, and then I'm going to play a, a video clip to you, and I want you to come off the back of it. But first of all, the acronym PEP, what's a PEP? A PEP is a person who is progressive, except for Palestine. But I want to be very clear. That, that, mm. ain't, that ain't my acronym. People have mm. been saying that movement for a very long time. Okay. That's the language of a Palestinian critique. Uh, not me personally, although I did uh, do a book, which is conveniently sitting here, called very Except for Palestine. Yes. yes, The Limits of Progressive Politics, which I wrote with my dear friend uh, and colleague Mitchell Plitnik. Who is uh, Jewish. But, yeah, who, in, indeed, he is. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's those people who have progressive politics on all the major issues. Apart seem to hit from right. Palestine. All right. So bearing yeah. that in mind, now, now that you know that acronym uh, that Mark has used but he didn't come up with, I want you to have a listen, Mark, to Olivia and then respond to her video comment. Here we go. Being progressive except on Palestine is easy. We don't learn world history in U.S. schools. And forget hearing anything about black history, which can be one entry point into Palestinian liberation circles. But the tides are changing because now we have things like Snapchat and TikTok, as silly as that might sound. Because in this way, we all become eyewitnesses to history unfolding around the world. We get to access what generations of black and Palestinian liberation circles have been trying to tell us for decades. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the, the key to the question of the PEP um, is that we can identify it. We can point to it as a contradiction, but we have to point to it as an unsustainable contradiction. Right. It, we can't say they're a PEP as if it's some quirk, as if it's some personality quirk. Like, oh, you know, he's a PEP. Like, no, we have to see it as a morally unsustainable position. If someone were, were progressive except for South Africa. If someone were progressive except for marriage equality, if someone were progressive except for 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 you know ending slavery in, in the 18th century, we wouldn't say, oh, they you know they're progressive, they're they're, they're pests, right? No, it, we we would say that that's a morally unsustainable position. And, but because of how much we have normalized Palestinian oppression, there's a way that even the Palestinian liberation movement, particularly among liberals and, and often liberal Zionists, we make it seem as if being a pep is okay, or that if it's a quirk as opposed to something that's actually outrageous. You cannot be progressive except for Palestine. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, I'm just okay. wondering, go, you go first, I'll, I'll go second, go ahead. Now I was saying, unfortunately, that's actually um, all over the movements that we're a part of. It's not just like, you know, in one certain space, it's that we come to movement spaces around immigration and people not seeing the con connection between borders and immigration and talking about an issue like Palestine or talking about racial justice and incarceration 
or even talking about, uh, you know, the military industrial complex. Like Palestine is a part of those conversations. If you are a person that believes in global justice, when we're talking about a global pandemic where uh, almost 550,000 Americans died and many, many more across the world, why shouldn't we be fighting for Palestinians to also have access to the vaccine, for example, or health care for Palestinians or the right to travel for, for Palestinians? And for some reason in our movements, people believe that you could be pro-immigration and go stand at the border and say, oh, my God, I cannot fathom the separation of families and children. But then you support the state of Israel, who does that to Palestinian families all the time. Or when you say, oh, I don't support white supremacy in the United States and I'm going to stand up against white supremacy, but I support the state of Israel, who has nation state laws that are literally codified that discriminate against Palestinians and other minorities in the state of Israel, that literally treat Palestinians who live within the Israel as second and third class citizens. So that kind of, of what Mark is talking about, morally unsustainable, it's also inconsistent. And so I cannot trust you in the movement if your kind of lens around racial justice or justice in general is only in the American context and you can't seem to apply that across the world. And that is kind of the tension that we found in the movement, particularly uh, around Palestine. And for me, it's not about Palestine being a litmus test. I'm not, I don't test people at the door of the movements. I don't ask you what your position is on Palestine, but it tells me a lot about who you are if you can support a state like Israel and, and, and be able to come to a movement and say Black Lives Matter in mm. the United States. It just doesn't it just doesn't kind of make sense. And also for people who will say, yes, of course, Linda, Netanyahu is a, you know, a fascist. He's a bad leader. He's, you know, a you know, disgraceful leader in the state of Israel. But remember, Palestinians have been displaced, dispossessed, occupied since 1948. Netanyahu has not been the prime minister of the state of Israel since 1948. So this idea of trying to like use Netanyahu as a boogeyman and everyone's like standing with me on the street saying, yeah, Netanyahu's bad. It's not enough. I need you to say end the occupation. I need you to say lift the siege on Gaza. And I need you to say that you see the liberation of the Palestinian people bound up with the safety and security of Jewish people. And if you don't see those two peoples being able to coexist in a place and be all able to live under one constitution where they all access to, to laws, it's just not going to work for me. It's not going to work. And the, and the movements are not accepting uh, any other kind of conclusion or resolution to this conflict. Mark and Linda, I want you to have a look at some pictures that I, I put together on my laptop because it's sort of a progression of the civil rights movement into where we are now with Black Lives Matter movement. This is Muhammad Ali, I believe this is 1970, visiting Palestinians in a Lebanese refugee camp. Mm -hmm. uh, then we fast forward George Floyd murals from around Palestine. Rest in peace, Big Floyd. This is remarkable. I, and then I'm just going to end here. Uh, Mark, on, on your Instagram, and, and you shared a portrait of George Floyd hanging in Gaza City. Where are we now? Where does this solidarity get us? What difference is it going to make? Very briefly, Mark. I, I believe that it's a re-energizing of those connections that Linda talked about, that you know, since the 40s and 50s, we've seen connections. Since the 60s, we've seen powerful connections. Um, and when you see those pictures of George Floyd on the wall, the apartheid wall in Bethlehem, or when you see it in, in Gaza City, you see that people are paying attention to what's happening here. And when you see us uh, in, in, uh, in the United States paying careful attention to what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in the West Bank, what's happening inside of Israel, mm -hmm. what's happening throughout the diaspora, as Muhammad Ali did, it shows you that we're on the right path. But the key now is to test our political will. It's not enough to just say Black Lives Matter. It's not yeah. enough to just say free Palestine. We have to do the work of voting the right way, organizing the right, right way, spending the right way, etc. I've got one more question for you, uh, Linda, on YouTube. I'm going to make it very quick. You've got one minute to answer. It's a hard question, though. What can we do to help our brothers and sisters in Palestine? Ask Donovan. Good question for you, Linda, to wrap us up with. Absolutely. I need people to stay unapologetic about their public support for the Palestinian people. Do not back down. Do not worry about the weaponization of anti-Semitism. You are on the right side of history. So t keep sharing the stories of Palestinians. As Mark said, make sure in elections that you vote the right way, particular in federal elections, so we can see more Rashida Tlaibs and Ilhan Omars and Cori Bushes yeah. and Jamal Bowmans. And also support your Palestinian family and friends, not only those who live, of course, in Palestine, but here, right. amplify their voices. So I appreciate that question and Black and Palestinian solidarity forever. 
Linda Sassoon, Mark Lamont Hill, it's really good to have you. You see them there live in person. Have a look here on my laptop. You can follow them in the digital world as well. Linda Sassoon on Twitter and this Mark Lamont Hill on Twitter. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, YouTube audience as well. Thank you, audience watching on TV around the world. I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you.